and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to introduce today's presenter, Joe Clark. Thanks, Kate. Um, so like Kate said, my name is Joe Clark, and today we're going to be talking about digital workspace delivery and what that combination of words even really truly means uh, from a practical standpoint. So just a little bit about me today. Um, my name is Joe Clark. I'm a principal architect here at Advisex. Um, I've been involved with the design and architecture of mobility and desktop and end user computing based solutions for the past decade and have um, really focused in on what virtualization in combination with um, end user computing life cycles can do and how things are changing. So I do have a laundry list of certs over there. Most of those aren't exciting, so we'll move on. The agenda for today, um, what we're really going to be looking at at is first how consumerization um, this is this is really sort of a driving point of, of why this is really relevant uh, to everybody today we'll talk about some of the modern advancements and the way that we see a lot of folks changing the way that they are managing and delivering applications to end users and then we will have a live demo so that's always exciting because anytime there's a live demo there's you know potential for live demo fail so um, <clears throat> kind of like that just happened. All right, cool. Um, so um, when we're looking at, um, then we'll also be looking at why Advisex is positioned as a leader in modernizing application delivery. So um, that's that's the rough agenda for today. Um, so <clears throat> into uh, consumerization. Why does why does any of this matter? The reason this matters is because if you look through history, the client server era is kind of coming to a close and the mobile application era is sort of on the rise. And that's, that's just evident in the way we live our lives. People use Uber for, um, you know, for driving around, they use their phone. Um, just as a matter of practical example, uh, when I'm flying now, I can get by with using only my phone and not using pulling out a laptop and doing everything I need it to do. Um, so the way that we manage devices is simply going to change and the way that we manage the pathways that we give our end users to get to their applications will change. So in 2018, so today, what are the catalysts? Why, why is current computing changing? Why today? We see a couple of different things. We see a modern workforce where we see where folks want to use many different devices. They want basically anywhere app access, meaning that um, I want you know Salesforce not only on my computer, but I want it to be native on my phone. Um, I want you know, the mobile workflows to be seamless so that I can change between devices and not lose a lot of information. I want that Netflix-like experience where I can just pick up where I left off. And we see emerging delivery models, meaning that if you are moving to Office 365 or you're using SaaS-based applications as a part of how you're delivering apps, now you have to worry about how users are authenticating to those apps and you don't deliver them by just you know downloading some uh, installer files, setting up servers, installing software on the servers, and setting up a client-side app, and then everybody's connected. And then they get in over the VPN. We don't really do that with like a, with SaaS-based services like ServiceNow or Salesforce or any of that. Um, you simply just tap into it. So now we still have to ensure that we can offer people access in a simple way, which gets more and more complex when you have applications scattered across the different methods of deployment and delivery. So the mobile workforce is only growing, and we're slated to hit um, and are on pace to hit 1.75 billion mobile workers in 2020. And that, that is just huge because what that, is, what that is saying is the need for mobility and the need for access to applications not just behind a desk and in a cube is, is absolutely growing. Also, the way humans work is changing. Just like I was saying about myself on, on the airplane, we see desktop usage actually shrinking with, with some people saying they can just use a tablet for 43% of their day. Um, <clears throat> and that the number of devices that folks have are also increasing at an amazing rate. And also in 2018, by 2018, um, we're gonna see that 95% of enterprises are globally are going to have either a choose your own device or a formal bring your own device plan in place and that's and that's not 100 percent accurate um, you know, with it being 2018 from my personal experience 
But what we are seeing is that this is certainly a conversation that we are having with every one of our customers now. So whether or not one is in place is certainly uh, up for debate in my opinion, but it, it is certainly something that is top of mind. The primary catalyst today for what we see, Windows 10 and Microsoft, Chromebooks and mobile devices. So with Windows 10, Microsoft has taken a much different approach in how they are handling the management of the operating system and the delivery of applications. They've basically sort of said, we are giving control of application installs, patch management, um, and device security posture to mobile device management softwares. And what that means is basically, we, we basically have to change the name of mobile device management to unified endpoint management. What we're looking at is um, these catalysts right here are saying people are working differently. People want to combine work with uh, personal sometimes, and sometimes they want to keep it separate. And it's different for each customer and how their posture is with security. But regardless, we see Google, Microsoft, and Apple being major catalysts in why these things are changing. Um, another great example is if anyone has ever used the uh, Apple Store or the Google Play Store, um, the experience there is, is very seamless. Logging in, opening it, launching an app, downloading it, you, you're right where you left off. If your phone falls into the ocean, you can go to the Apple Store and get another one and be back up and running very, very quickly uh, with all of your data you know, securely protected. And that's kind of the mindset of what the catalysts are, is that folks are saying, you know what, if, if we can do this uh, with my you know, Angry Birds app, why in the world does it take me so long to get back online with my ERP after I lose my laptop? That just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so, there's, so there's a lot of folks that are, that are saying, you know what, we're, we're just demanding a different level of service. And Windows 10 is a stake in the ground specifically because of the change they made where they said, now you can sign directly into work or school as a function of the operating system. So starting in 1703, we're seeing that functionality being available. And it's only being improved upon in 1709 in the fall creators update of Windows 10. So what we're seeing here is that that is definitely a major driver and change in the way folks are managing or looking to manage their fleets of Windows 10 devices, whether those are laptops, desktops, you name it. If it's Windows 10, it's going to change how it's managed. So that's where we're talking about unified endpoint management. The concept here is that it's a single way to manage all the endpoints. The idea is that we want to have policy and security-based management across all the devices, no matter what they are, because what we truly care about is our applications, our security, and the user's data, and making sure that we can present those all in a way that is seamless and easy to access, while at the same time providing IT the needs it has for security, the ability to enterprise wipe devices and ensure that data is protected from uh, corporate risks. Another interesting thing that, that we see is that Gartner themselves has actually retired their quadrant for traditional client management tools. So your SCCM, uh, Tivoli, all those tools, um, Gartner's actually said that we're, we've retired the quadrant simply because they see it not playing necessarily a super valuable role in the future with the management of uh, Windows uh, devices and traditional desktop management. Uh, they see it moving more along the way of unified endpoint management the idea being where we would have a single eye in the sky management plane um, that would allow us to push applications, adjust security posture, create fencing between applications, um, and really allow us to manage devices completely and totally um, from a single platform. So as we're looking at that though, <clears throat> one of the big key points here is that not every organization is the same. Just because every organization is looking at a bring your own device or choose your own device policy doesn't necessarily mean that they want or need to implement one now or they all have to implement them the exact same way. So on this side, we've got two spectrums, one of complete management and one of no device management. And a lot of times it just depends on the organization's business model and security posture in how much control they will yield or turn over to end users in regards to device choice and everything else. So if we look on the left, we've got sort of like the full, like bring your own device 
um, you know, whatever it is, you bring it, you support it, we will give you access to applications versus on the right hand side where we have full device configuration and management and a lot of times device purchase provisioning and operations completely and solely owned by the organization. And some folks meet sort of right in the middle where it's a choose your own from a select list of devices or a choose your own from maybe a broader list of, of devices that, that, that you yourself would manage. Um, so there's a wide spectrum of ways that we can say we can allow employees to bring their own devices or or have the company provide them. And it just depends on where you are on the spectrum in regards to this. So the evolution of, of client computing has created this interesting problem where we have more and more ways to get apps and data. Um, if you think of, you know, even just using email for an example, you can get it on a web browser, you can get it on a native uh, application, on any number of native applications on a phone. You can install a thick client in on a desktop and install it, whether it's a Mac or a PC. Um, but then what happens when that happens? And, and the data is there, is there somewhere else? Um, because now we have more ways to get to applications and data we now have more things to manage. We have now have increased complexity because of the number of apps and data that we have to manage and present. So a lot of the challenges that we see folks facing are security and data protection for assets. Uh, that's, that's first and foremost. Uh, providing any app to any device is a lot of times right on its heels of security with saying, hey, we really wanna be able to ensure that we can deliver those applications quickly and ensure that if a user's laptop falls off a truck, that not only was that data protected, but they can get back in quickly. You know, we wanna ensure access from any device. We also wanna say um, managing access to remote applications um, and increase efficiency, that, that fall off a truck for example. Um, timely desktop requests. To be able to say, you know what, I know my laptop fell off a truck, but um, you know I can use another computer that is nearby until the the time comes that uh, that I get a you know a replacement computer. That has real value for a lot of folks. If if someone needs to be able to say, hey, you know what, I only need a desktop for like five minutes to do this, and then I'm back on my phone and I'm fine. Those are the kind of things that we want to be able to address. Um, we also want to ensure that operating systems are uh, patched and protected from ransomware and malware, which is always a, a, a challenge for sure. And we also want to allow for flexibility and endpoint choice for, um, you know, for IT service consumers. So what is a secure digital workspace? Um, to sum it up, the way that we have defined it at Advisix is it's an application and desktop delivery service with a focus on rapid and secure access. And I'd also add to that, that not only rapid and secure access, but native where possible. And, and native where possible is important because you can do anything you, know, you want with a secure digital workspace as long as you have a connection to the internet. But if you don't have a connection, sometimes it becomes very, very important to be able to provide a native app installation on whatever your platform is. So if that's a Windows or Mac laptop having a local install, or if that's a mobile device having a um, native application that's pushed, installed, and managed. So what do we see as some of the business outcomes from a secure digital workspace being implemented? We see improved posture and the ability to mitigate risk. We also see lower operational management expenses um, and simply by um, saying instead of having to buy laptops, you are merely opening the gate and allowing folks in to access applications. We also improve end user application availability because when we have a myriad of devices that we can use to connect and use our applications, it allows us to say, oh, you know what, if, if my de one device is offline or not charged, I can still use my application and be productive. We also see enabling remote workers for cost reduction. It's becoming more and more important for some uh, companies to take the business model of nine hour days from home instead of eight hour days in the office with an hour of commute on each end. So we're seeing that for, uh, for cost reduction and employee satisfaction. We also wanna decrease the time for new application access. And this one is really important. Uh, when we look at the example that VMware actually provided for us um, during their implementation of their digital workspace, um, what, what we saw there is that they went from one week of time of getting ready to present applications and, and ensure that, that, a, that a 
that a new employee would be onboarded, having all their ID, all their applications ready to go. They decrease that down from a, a full week to two hours so that on the first day, they would be provisioned with their credentials, they would be logging in, they would be using their applications, they would have access to everything. And so basically that two hours was simply just a onboarding um, session where they would show everyone how to log in and, and, and how to access everything, and that was about it. Um, we also see multi-device support for any application, meaning um, it's, it's the quintessential question where you have uh, someone that is um, maybe very high importance in, a, in an organization that wants to use a device that doesn't have a native application support for it. So if you had an executive that wanted to open a Microsoft project file on their Mac OS operating system, they would not be able to do that. So the ability to provide folks multiple avenues of accessing applications um, is becoming of increasing importance and definitely an outcome with the digital workspace. And then we also see faster onboarding and offboarding with lower IT effort being the key there. That the time it took to lift the gate and allow people in to access applications is much lower of an effort than it is to image, keep inventory, and manage devices on an individual basis. So what's actually in this secure digital workspace? If we were going to say, okay, well, this is, this is nice, you know, what, what's in it? Well, we typically have an application delivery mechanism for both locally and remote applications on every major platform. So if you want to push an app to a device, you can do it. If you want to provide remote access to a device, you can do it. So an application delivery mechanism for both locally installed and remote apps. We see single sign-on for all applications, including SaaS applications. What that means is um, you sign on once, and once you sign on with that username and password, you are single sign on into the remaining applications. So you don't have to remember five different sets of credentials for five different SaaS applications or on prem applications. Uh, we see security intelligence that allows for proactive alerting. Um, user based analytics is a huge part of our secure digital workspace simply because it allows us to take, um, sort of put our finger in the air and say, what's, what's abnormal? Not what, is, um, not what is happening all the time because that's too much information, but what is when something is off or not right. And that's that um, user behavior analytics. Um, we see consolidated and select distributed data enveloped with policy and security posture. What that means is if you have documents that are secure and you want to ensure that you are um, providing employees manners to sh with which to share the documents with each other, and with people outside the organization but want to maintain record and compliance around those documents that we see that being a huge part of the digital workspace as well i think it's important to note too that a lot of times when we're looking at solution architecture we can architect with a single region we can architect with an always-on uh, multi-region architecture and now we can even look at architecting in the cloud if we're looking at saying we would prefer the SaaS based slash offboarding model for a lot of our um, services, whether that be Windows presentation, SaaS, um, or anything else, that we can actually provide that, not only on-prem, but uh, as a service. So when we're looking at the solution components, we've got virtual desktop application and application presentation, a, ca a global catalog, universal endpoint management capabilities, software-defined networking with microseg, um, end-user experience monitoring, UBA for cyber defense, multi-factor authentication, and proven defense against malware and ransomware. Um, and from a hardware perspective, we see we typically end up recommending hyper-converged infrastructure that allows people to start small and grow with their project. We see um, the desire there being for scale-out CPU memory and storage on a node basis so that uh, folks can, can really start to onboard and adopt at their own pace, which is unique for each organization. Um, we also see highly available file storage for end user data um, and high bandwidth, low latency data center switching is typically required for a multi data center deployment. So with Advisix's secure digital workspace, we're really going to be focusing in on the required components. Um, from a software standpoint, um, our two of our required component partners are uh, VMware and Microsoft. And the rest of the storage and compute is a lot of uh, what we see most customers asking for from a solution component standpoint. Um, and this is sort of uh, the idea here, though, is that 
any any compute and storage that is a supported uh, platform is is welcome and something that we are happy to talk about. Um, but as we're looking at the solution abstract, this is sort of the conceptual breakdown of how the secure digital workspace actually looks. So at the bottom, we have gray boxes, which indicate you pick, you know, the the label or vendor of your choice for both high bandwidth, low latency switching and hyperconverged infrastructure. So that's servers with storage um, that are running hyperconverged storage software. Moving up a layer into software, we see inside the hypervisor, we use VMware NSX, vSphere, and vSAN together with an anti-malware product. And that is oftentimes at the platform level because we do recommend where possible putting that inside of the hypervisor layer as to not bloat the image and, and cause additional overhead and worsen consolidation ratios. As we step up from the platform, we look at really how are we presenting applications. So uh, Workspace One is a key component of our secure digital workspace, and so is productivity and identity management. And so we see that with uh, Windows and Office as well being a key part of almost every single project that we do with Workspace One, and uh, that is definitely something that is that is important. And then moving up, we have user behavior analytics. Uh, we partner with Verona State Alert. We leverage vRealize Operations, which is a VMware product for operations management, and Lakeside SysTrack for end user experience monitoring. And what that gives us is basically that thumbs up, thumbs down, and ability to drill down inside of the guest OS, allowing us to answer every question about every aspect of what is happening in the environment at any given time. And if we look big picture, there's three gray boxes in the middle of this architecture slide. One is identity services, one is UEM, Unified Endpoint Management Services, and one is virtualization. And we really see that Workspace One is not a um, hot, you know, we just, um, we, we work with you guys to get a hot cake, you know, in, in front of you and, and, and ready for you to eat. It's not, it's not that simple. A lot of times, some folks are leveraging an, a different uh, identity service provider or they might have uh, Citrix apps or something else from a virtualization standpoint, or they might be using something different from a mobile device management perspective as well. And so what we really see is that while Workspace One is a combination of all three of these primary functions of identity, UEM and virtualization, that they're not always all required. Um, but we do see there are some pretty significant strategic benefits from combining the three services that VMware has to offer in their portfolio, uh, specifically device posturing by leveraging both a UEM device in combination with the identity service, uh, which is which is a, a very unique value proposition. So um, if we take uh, a technology drill down second and say, what are the components that make up those gray boxes? Like you talked about things, you know, pretty generically, Joe, like what are some of the things that actually make up Workspace ONE? We're talking about VMware Identity Manager. We're talking about the product VMware Horizon Suite and VMware AirWatch. And that those three together are the three core components that comprise Workspace ONE. And together they have a tremendous ability to provide a very unified experience that we'll be demoing later during this webinar. So Identity, identity Manager we really see is the heart of Workspace ONE. It's consumer simple and enterprise secure. We see that this sort of being the portal, the self-service access, sort of that landing page that provides a unified look and feel across every single device that a user would use to engage with their digital workspace from. And that's whether that's a native application or whether that is um, just through a web browser. So we see the ability to choose your own device, secure email. Um, we can allow conditional access to based on device posture and whether or not that device is enrolled, which is a really, really unique value proposition to be able to say, if I want to change how many authentication steps my users have to walk through in order to allow them into an application, depending on what kind of a device they're connecting from, whether they're connecting from a device that I know and trust and has been patched in the last uh, several months, that that is something that is most certainly um, a value proposition that we see with the digital workspace. And then scalable automation being another very key part of it. So we see that simple unified catalog looking 
working exactly the same, not only in a web browser, but in a native app experience on any device. And we see that that pretty, pretty much provides a better overall mobile user experience. And it allows folks to use Touch ID and pin authentication for logging in. So what does that mean? That means if someone is using an iOS device or an Android device that allows for biometric authentication, that they can use that as a way of authenticating into their applications, which can provide a lot of benefit and some, uh, and some real time reduction uh, to employees looking to access their applications remotely. So if we look at Identity Manager on-premises and how that is laid out, there is a virtual appliance that's typically installed on-premises and then it's connected to the internet with the users. And Identity Manager is also available as a SaaS-based application that can be consumed as a SaaS service as well. From a desktops and apps, we see VMware Horizon being the key for delivering Windows experiences. And that's whether that is individualized applications or that is an entire desktop experience. And the practical concept of whether or not you deliver a desktop versus an individual application almost always comes down to whether or not you need to deliver a conclusive suite of applications versus delivering individualized one-off apps that are merely jumped into and jumped right out of with very little integration with other applications. And this is an example of a pod block architecture that we would often um, come to if we were looking at leveraging an on-premises infrastructure. And a lot of times uh, this is because the applications that need to be accessed oftentimes live on-prem if they are using some sort of a app Windows delivery experience. So more often than not, we find that um, the, the reason that folks would use either a remote desktop or remote um, application presentation strategy is to get the users closer to the server side of the application. Another key point of what we include uh, with the secure digital workspace is VMware NSX. And a big part of that is micro segmentation. Uh, the idea that east-west firewalling is extremely important uh, from a security perspective and, and all CIOs minds today sort of top of mind of saying we just need to assume that people are going to get in and we need to do everything that we can to mitigate that after they get in. And that's very difficult to do from a physical firewall perspective and it's very cost prohibitive from a throughput, a throughput and switch point count perspective. So in traditional networking for you know virtual desktops or RDSH desktops, uh, what we end up seeing is that we would have several smaller subnets that all have um, you know a certain number of desktops in them, and that makes, that's more networks to manage, and it's it's it adds complexity and it doesn't allow for granular network security because all those desktops can still talk to each other on that network. And what we see with NSX in the picture when we bring that Windows experience into the data center is that we can actually create a single firewall rule that prevents all of those desktops from even talking to each other. And why is that important? Because we have some slightly compelling evidence that uh, and malware techniques are very, very keen on scanning local networks and trying to propagate as fast as possible from a desktop to another desktop. Um, and that and we've seen that happen in the physical desktop space as well as in the virtual desktop space. But with NSX in the picture, that's important because the first thing that happens is when we saw the exploits for WannaCry and everything coming out, uh, the exploit would arrive you know, via an exploit, um, whether it was downloaded or run, um, and then it would, it would uh, be executed, and then it would spread to other devices. And the difference is micro-segmentation prevents the spread to other devices by acting as east-west firewalling between them while they exist on the same network segment. So we feel that that's a very key um, value prop in combination with traditional anti-malware uh, prevention techniques. So one of the things we also wanted to point out is that AirWatch, which is the third leg of Workspace ONE, supports all endpoints and use cases. So if you can think of an endpoint, we can manage it, we can push applications to it, we can configure security posture, and it also provides us with a modern management framework so that we can do out-of-the-box configuration, over-the-air updates, asset tracking. Um, we can push policies and security settings and provide full lifecycle management for the devices. 
So another thing that's really important to understand is that unmanaged application, unmanaged devices versus managed devices allow us to change our security posture. And this is in the unique value proposition that VMware has when you combine both Identity Manager and AirWatch together, is that we can allow access to applications only from secure devices, or instead of that being a red X, we could simply say, how about we step up the authentication and say, if you're connected from a device that we do not trust, we are going to go ahead and require that you use multi-factor authentication instead of um, maybe a simple certificate or PIN-based authentication from a device that's managed by AirWatch. And so now I just wanted to take some time and start the demo for what we've got going on today. All right, so I wanted to quickly just familiarize you guys with the setup that I am using today and make sure that I'm logged in everything and good to go. So we've got a couple of different desktops today. I've got my Mac that I am using that uh, will be playing the part of the, the, the Mac today. I've also got a Windows 10 desktop that is enrolled in AirWatch and uh, will be playing the part of the enrolled device that I might have as a secondary desktop. Um, and all of these are configured with bring your own device policies that I will be di diving into. Um, and then we've also got a hotel kiosk computer that will be playing the part of uh, a hotel kiosk. So that is um, that is the third one. And then finally, we've also got my iPhone so that we can uh, sort of see that real um, transition between not only the iPhone, but other types of computing devices as well. So I just kind of wanted to start by pointing out that this is the catalog as viewed from an iOS device. I've got some bookmark favorite applications that I've got here in my catalog. And if I go to catalog, one of the things that I notice is that there's different types of applications. And if we look here at Adobe Reader, this little down arrow indicates that I actually have a native installer available for iOS that I can download and install if I would like. And so I can search through this for particular applications if I would, if I would like to grab one. Um, and here's some more applications down here like Concur, AnyConnect, British Airways, um, Box, other applications that are native to my iOS device, and I can simply download and access. Now, if we are to come over to um, our hotel computer, and say we launch uh, our Workspace ONE URL, which would be you know unique to whatever your application is, um, we'll be presented with a login box that we would just log in with with our username and password. And I've got that same look and feel to the catalog. So I've got the same applications, not only um, virtual desktops, but virtual presented applications that are available to me to install. And I also have some SaaS-based applications that I can access, such as Office 365, Salesforce, and SocialCast. Now, if I come to the catalog, similar to how I did with uh, iOS, we'll notice one minor thing, and that's that I can't actually install any of these applications locally. And the reason for that is because this is not an enrolled device in AirWatch. We have no manner within which to push those applications down to this device. However, if I launch the Workspace ONE application from inside of the Windows 10 managed device, Got to resign in there. We'll see that I'm actually able to download and install applications that are available to me in Windows 10. So again, very similar catalog look and feel. It feels exactly the same, but now I have additional applications available to me that I can install natively. And these are different applications, you'll notice, um, than the applications that were available on the iPhone. Uh, for example, if we bit back to the iPhone real quick, doo -doo -doo, we'll notice that British Airways is one of the uh, available applications here. And British Airways is not an available application for me to install over here on Windows 10. The reason for that being is that there's, there's not a native Windows 10 application for British Airways. They expect when you're on a machine that you're just going to use a full browser experience. However, when we do have native apps, 
we want to ensure that we can actually push and publish those individually for each of those applications. So that is the overview that I've got of the portal and sort of that portal experience and how that might change uh, from place to place. So I also wanted to demo for you one of the differences in single sign-on capabilities. So say, for example, I want to sign into Salesforce. So I simply click on Salesforce after I am logged in. Do, 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 do. There we go. And I can perform a certificate-based authentication because my device is enrolled with uh, AirWatch. What that means is I don't have to type a password. I can get straight into Salesforce by simply logging into my Workspace ONE application and going straight into it in a web browser. Now, say I really cared about Salesforce and I wanted to make sure that if I was going to log into Salesforce from, a, say, an untrusted app place, like, say, a hotel kiosk, that I had to perform some sort of a step up authentication. Well, what we can do is we can actually configure Identity Manager to say, we would really rather prefer that you use multi-factor authentication using, and in this case, we can use any multi-factor authentication, but we want to ensure that we are using the VMware Verify app because this is actually multi-factor authentication that is provided as a service with Workspace ONE. And so what does that mean? Multi-factor means I have something I have and something I know. I've already put in my password, so that's something that I know. And something I have might be my phone. So if I look at my verify, I'll notice that I actually have a notification that says, hey, you need to go ahead and sign in. So if I click on test drive here, doo -doo -doo, I can either put in a token or I can actually sign in automatically. So let's try it again. Let's do that a little bit more seamless. And we've got it saying a new identification approval three seconds ago. We say approve, request approved. We swipe back and bam, we are in with multi-factor authentication from an unsecured device. Whereas when we had a secured enrolled device, all we had to do was just click on the icon uh, after we'd authenticated into Workspace ONE and we were in because we had a, an elevated posture of trust there. Um, another thing that we can do that's actually really cool um, and I just kind of wanted to demonstrate this from the perspective of the portal. Um, what I've just switched to right now is the AirWatch console. And this is sort of the eye in the sky for uh, universal endpoint management and device management. And I just want to take a quick second just to dive into the Windows desktop that uh, is playing the part of the BYOD uh, Windows 10 device that I've got configured right here. So one of the cool things that we can do is we can apply profiles to these devices, which allow us to say whether it's Windows 10, whether it's you know a different um, uh, operating system, each operating system has different ways of implementing security controls. And how can we do that? <clears throat> and we can implement them in any number of ways. So I wanted to highlight one of these policies that we've got configured right here. One of the policies that we have configured is called this Windows Tunnel. Um, and this is uh, basically VMware has written an app called the VMware Tunnel application, which is supported on Android devices, iOS devices, Windows devices. And what this allows us to do is basically say, we would just like to force all of this browser traffic for this particular application. And if we wanted for any particular URLs back through a VPN. So what does that really mean in this case? Well, the way this policy is configured, when we open Internet Explorer, we should be able to access uh, a internal corporate based application uh, because we are connecting in with a VPN. So let's give that a try now that we've opened this uh, Internet Explorer session up. If we want to go to an internal web website, let's give this a second and make sure we've got tunnel running. If we go under the, uh, the task manager here, we will see that VMware Tunnel is the application that's actually running in the background. And that should be opened automatically at the time that we open our Internet Explorer. So let's try connecting through. Let's try closing open this guy one more time. Everybody loves live demos.
Can't reach the page. Boo hiss. Let's try from over here. Let's switch over to our mobile platform and see if we can't demonstrate it there then. All right, so if we are in our catalog and we've got our bookmarked applications, the application that I'm trying to access is an internal, basically like an intranet site. One of the ways that we can do that on iOS is by providing access through the VMware browser application, which is a secure application which allows us to VPN tunnel back in and single sign on into the application and present it on the back end. So right now what's happening is Workspace ONE is automatically signing into the application for us. In this case, because it's a Kerberos based application, we'll put in our password one more time. We'll type it correctly this time though. And we've got access to corpsite.vmdemo.int, which is an internal based website. So we see this is an internal website being uh, published and that is an internal URL. So let's come back here and let's, let's just try this one more time with this guy. You can't reach that page. Well, that's the fun. That is, that is the fun of um, live demos. Let me take a second here. See if I can't kickstart it one more time. Nope, that's okay. Well, I don't want to tell you except it worked right before the demo. <laughs> Moving on. Um, <clears throat> One of the things I also wanted to demonstrate was some of the application delivery experience that we have. Um, if we're trying to de deploy applications on an operating system that they aren't natively supported on. So for example, if I have applications that are similar to like Internet Explorer 6 based applications, and I wanna run that on a Mac, well, that's just going to be really, really difficult because Internet Explorer 6 is barely supported on Windows, much less on a Mac. So when we launch the shortcut here, what's happening in the back end is I'm actually being connected to a server that actually has a thin app, which is a virtualized presentation of Internet Explorer. So I can actually access Internet Explorer 6 right here on my Mac. Now this is through a remote session, again, because Internet Explorer 6 is not supported natively on the Mac, um, but that is, um, this is a sad browser. And one of the interesting things too is that talking about the continuity of experience, if I wanted to migrate that um, and, and get access back into that session from where I am on a mobile device, let's flop over and let's get connected to it here from our mobile device. One tap of the button and it's going to disconnect that session from um, my Windows 10 experience and get me logged in on my um, iOS device. And we can see that uh, my my comment about the browser remains resolute um, and it is still a, a sad browser. However, now I'm accessing Internet Explorer 6 from my iOS device seamlessly and I picked up right where I left off. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, that's cool. It's a web browser. I could, I could use a web browser on a native device anyway. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. Um, but what if you needed to do something a little bit more complex? What if you needed to deliver an application, say, that maybe had some graphics capabilities inside of it? Um, so I wanted to take just a quick second to demonstrate um, some of the graphics capabilities. Now, again, um, you guys are on a webinar, so some of this has to be taken with a grain full of salt because you can't expect um, you know, some applications that are, have high graphics performance to show up just as well as if um, you were sitting right here, right next to me on my desk. But one of the things that we see is that um, we see that even when we have um, <clears throat> uh, applications that have a high level of performance and requirement, um, this is just, it's, it's churning just like butter on my screen over here, which is fantastic. Um, so when we have applications like, oh, say, any sort of modeling software, so your AutoCADs, your ArcGIS, um, 
any sort of 3D CAD modeling software that you might want to present out that is not native to the operating system, now we can do that. Um, that one of the recent updates too that's actually just came out um, is the fact that we can now actually present 3D applications now not only as the part of a full desktop experience, but now we can deliver them as individually presented applications. So if somebody needed to say, for example, just deliver one application um, instead of a full desktop suite that had some graphics requirements, that's certainly something that we could handle. So, and again, I know you can't really tell from, from where you guys are because this is a webinar and it probably looks choppy over the, uh, the go to webinar. But what I'm seeing in front of me is a very, very seamless transition of the model being rendered on my screen. Um, and that is on from my Windows device that I am accessing that from. So the simple fact is that not only can we um, deliver applications that have a high graphics requirement, but we can deliver them pretty much to any device. So say my Windows 10 device uh, bites the dirt and I want to get back into this from, say, that hotel computer. Well, no problem. I can just come into that hotel computer, log into Workspace ONE, and from uh, not even having anything installed, one of the things I can do is I can actually access, um, I can actually access this session directly through Workspace ONE uh, browser. Uh, so let's let's reconnect to that sucker. Da -da 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 -da. Never save your credentials on a kiosk, Joe. And so what we can see now is I'm, I'm actually configured right back to where I was left off before uh, with my 3D application, except now instead of accessing it with a client that was locally installed on my device because I was connecting from a managed device, now I can run it. I can run it straight from a web browser, so I can actually access not only desktops but presented applications and all my SaaS-based applications, really no matter where I am, with uh, the policy and security controls that um, that IT wants to have in the same time with delivering a seamless end user experience for the end users. So if we really wanted to, I don't think that. Um, we would really want to, uh, you know, connect to a 3D application from a mobile device, but let's demonstrate that anyway. Say we wanted to connect to it from our mobile device. Let's give that a shot. And there we are, back again with our application that is actually showing up surprisingly well, even right here on my mobile device. And all of that with the continuity of experience. So just flipping back briefly to the AirWatch portal, um, there are so many different types of configurations that we can configure inside of policies. So um, for example, if we open up Windows 10 and we just, we're looking at the VMware tunnel application, we'll notice that there's a couple different things that we can configure over here for tunneling. But if we wanted to actually change, let me see, yeah, let's change to sandbox. And we wanted to create a brand new profile for someone. We come under profiles say add profile and we can actually pick Mac OS, tvOS, Blackberry, Windows, Windows Rugged, Tizen, Chrome OS, Blackberry and sort of just go forward from there and say what are some of the things that we can actually manage in there if we wanted to manage a Windows desktop. Let's say it's a device-based profile or user-based profile. Let's go with the device-based profile for this example. We actually have all of these things along the side that we can choose to create a policy that we can use to lock down a device. So on Windows 10, we can have a passcode restriction. Um, we can have VPN restrictions as we walk through, credentials. 
And the good part about this is this is really where the operating system change has made a big difference with Windows 10 because it allows us to change the way that we manage and configure the devices that we have. Now, uh, with Windows updates, we can configure uh, things like whether we want it to come from Microsoft Update Service. Um, what are the windows in which we want those installed? Um, do we want peer-to-peer -peer optimization? In other words, if we have small branch offices, do we want clients to be able to download once and then share those with each other so they're not topping out the WAN link? And then on top of that all, we can use any sort of custom settings that the OMA DM client, which is the Microsoft um, management client, allows us to basically make manual configuration. So anything that Microsoft in the future says, hey, if you would like to manage, you know, BitLocker encryption key policy or something of that nature that is not already a native configuration of the policy, which BitLocker is a native encryption policy for, um, uh, for this. But um, if we wanted to make a change to that, we could do that with a custom configuration. Um, another thing I wanted to demonstrate really quickly is if we look at the Identity Manager portal, one of the really cool things about this is this actually gives us intel into what users are using. So if we look in the dashboard, we can see how many logins there are, how many applications they're accessing, um, and what the adoption rate really is uh, for a lot of our applications and usage. And having everyone drive driven through Workspace ONE as a manner of accessing their applications really allows for complete insight into not only usage of what folks are, are doing, but adoption rate, and as well as uh, security posturing and controlling. So let's head back into the, into the slide deck here. Um, I wanted to close out with sort of talking about the Advisex approach and methodology. And the way that we approach uh, services is the plan, build, manage circle that you see on the screen that we assess and design, pilot, deploy, and operate and optimize as a part of how we deliver services and how we look at architecting services for customers. And so here we've just got sort of an example approach summary where we're looking at strategic planning, platform design, pilot into prod, and operate and optimize as a part of our workflow. Another key point is that Advisex has veteran experience, not only in virtualization, but also security, networking, and Microsoft. And that strategically positions us above a lot of our competition when we're looking at digital workspace deployment and management. So why Rolt Advisex? We really bring proven design and implementation processes. We've done this before, and we've done it successfully. We deliver high quality deliverables and use a shoulder to shoulder implementation style that all of our customers have said is absolutely fantastic. Rolt Advisor also delivers comprehensive design. So when we're designing something, we don't just um, we don't just ask a couple questions and then throw something together. We really examine the business needs and the business processes as a part of our design methodology to ensure that we are designing solutions that actually solve a problem and aren't just something that's neat and cool. We've also earned industry recognition uh, as being the 2017 uh, VMware Partner Innovation Award and the 2017 uh, Partner Services Global Innovation Award. And we have many relevant solutions across many, many different industries that uh, are customers and partners of ours. So, you, you know, this guy right here, you, you may, you may come from a background where there's someone that's working with you that really is just trying to get something uh, pushed across. And a lot of times uh, as a customer, specifically when I worked in-house, um, I always felt like if I was sitting across the table from someone that really just wanted to sell me something, I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't really want much to do with that. Um, that, that I wasn't very excited because they didn't really have my best interests at heart. Um, so if someone's saying, hey, I'm selling these fine canvases as a customer, I, I, I felt like, you know, you know I, I don't really want a canvas, I want art. Um, you're, you're not really seeing the whole picture here of, of what it is that I'm wanting. So if that's the case, as a customer, then who would I want to partner with? Well, the answer is you want to partner with a painter. Because if you don't partner with a painter, you're simply having someone that's that is either producing a canvas or doesn't understand the mechanics of painting, doesn't understand what you even want painted. So Advisex really is the best of the best to partner with. And let's be perfectly honest, when you're trying to design for five nines of uptime, uh, there's no such thing as a happy little mistake. Sorry, Bob. There, there just isn't.
Um, and VMware has, uh, again, um, certainly certified by VMware as a global partner multiple years over and um, really a deep and broad experience set in every aspect of digital workspace deployment. Uh, with 96% customer loyalty and uh, expansion into multiple different areas of hybrid cloud security and data, um, lots of certified employees and uh, local and global operations, uh, Advisix is really positioned to help you with whatever you would need um, in the realm of the digital workspace. So if you want to know more about uh, the secure digital workspace, I would invite you guys to reach out to Advisix. Um, if you if you don't know who to reach out to, just go ahead and go to our website and use our contact form to get a hold of us. But one of the things that we would definitely say that you should try is take the test drive environment, which I was demonstrating for us today, for a test drive. That we would love to be a part of actually working through that with you. We can set up a completely independent environment that's all for you just to sign in and test. You can enroll devices, you can access applications, um, it takes minutes to provision and we can get it uh, set up for you and, and sit down with you in a meeting and say, hey, let's walk through it, let's walk through what you're trying to prove out, um, let's make sure that you know everything is okay. Um, like say, for example, you're just trying to test a specific device policy on an iPhone or you want to ensure that a Surface Pro can uh, is compatible for management with AirWatch or something like that. For sure, I would say this is an environment whereby which you can test those things without having to have a large investment in time with either setting up infrastructure for a POC or doing something otherwise. So it's free with no infrastructure attached. Um, you know, free like beer, not like a puppy. It does have a time bomb on it, but those are things that uh, that we're happy to work through with you guys and get you guys set up. So if you guys need help for your Windows 10 migration, or you're trying to get your, your mind around a BYOD, CYOD policy, or you're trying to figure out ways that you guys can reduce the heartburn of onboarding and offboarding employees, uh, we, would, we would love to be a part of that conversation, honestly, guys. And if you want to get a hold of us, uh, we're more than happy to set up a meeting to, to come in and talk to you guys about some of the ways that we are seeing practical changes happening um, in a lot of our organizations that we partner with. So with that, I will turn it back to Kate to close out the webinar, and I thank you guys very, very much for your time today.